welcome back. I didn't mean to tell him welcome back, but he is welcome back. <laughs> For the two one three. <laughs> Mr. Lynn Davis, is this you? It is indeed. How are you doing, guys? I'm doing great. This is Darius, and we also got Shane on the line. How are you this evening? Yeah, very well indeed. Thank you. Sorry about that little bit of confusion, but uh, I thought uh, I'd call in and try my arm, but I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to contact you guys for today. So it worked. That's the main thing. That's all right. We've got you now here. So uh, we've been uh, talking a little bit about you. You've got a uh, big, big project uh, coming up here. I um, believe it is called Emergency L.A., um, where we've got some of the star power of professional wrestling heading over to Hollywood. Uh, for those who have not caught on to the buzz, I, I believe this project came to you in the middle of the night. You woke up with an idea. What was that idea? Well, basically, literally, I woke up about 5 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning. It was, my, my brain was literally just full of this whole thing. Um, the emergency services to me, I've always been a guy who's been on the side of the 911 crew. And uh, it's always a sense of heroics when these guys literally just put, and girls, put their lives on the line to, uh, to answer a 911 call, not knowing what they're walking into. Um, so basically, I've been speaking with Kurt for a little while because I've, I've known him since working with TNA. And we've spoken about acting, and his face just came straight into me in the sergeant's uniform. Uh, so I immediately, within about five or six hours, I had the whole thing written down, all the characters, all the plots, all the outlines. And um, because I've been working with uh, with Kat as well, or Winter, as she was known with TNA, um, I just had her straight in my head as being a motorcycle cop. I don't know where that came from, but the vision is pretty strong. But yeah, basically Emergency LA covers um, LAPD, it covers um, LA City Fire Department, Station 77 in particular, and it covers a, a medical center called Trauma One. And it's all to do with the, uh, the days, the routines, the rescues, and everything that goes on in the life of a first responder. All right. Now, uh, the, as I understand it, you're still in the funding process. Uh, pilot has not actually been uh, filmed yet. Is that correct? That's totally correct. I mean, at the moment, we've got the, the pilot script. We're well in pre-production with it, and we're talking to quite a few uh, networks and independent financiers as well. Um, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that it is going to happen. Um, we've got uh, about five meetings coming up next week, and I've made a major presentation again today to one of the major networks. And we've never had a negative response to it. It's always been a positive one. Uh, nobody's had a flat-out no. It's always a case of um, they like what they're seeing. They're excited about the project itself. They just need to get other people higher up on site. Right. And, and let me ask you this. Since we're on this side um, of, the, of, the, of the television here, um, how does this process work? I mean, do you normally have to get all the funding first, or do you, are you able to, like, film it yourself and then, you know, the pilot episode and then sell it? With it? How How is your approach to, to getting this on TV? I mean, there there are several ways you can go, and I'm approaching every single one because one of them will, will surprise you. Um, basically, you can approach the network, and then they'll come on board and uh, fund up for the pilots, and then once the pilot's shot, they'll put it through their various committees and audience reaction polls and whatever and see if they're happy with what they see. And if they are, then um, they'll commission the series. That's the old school way of doing it. But usually it means that uh, three to six months after you've shot the pilot, if you're being picked up, that's when you shoot the series. That's why pilots and the next episode sometimes look a bit different because of that time, time lag in between. Um, the, the more modern way of doing it, like with these online companies like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, uh, to my understanding that I've been told is that they tend to commission all 13 episodes. Um, and they will basically fund it piecemeal. So you'll be shooting, I mean, the pilot is a 14-day shoot. Uh, each episode is a 10-day shoot. So it's two actual working weeks. So they will know from seeing the footage pretty much instantaneously whether they like what they're seeing. The edits can be done quite quickly these days, so they'll see some sort of rough edit very very soon after the shoot. Um, so they they have the choice to pull the plug very easily if by episode two or three they're not happy with it. 
So that's what they tend to do a lot more of these days because yeah, you have two different measures. And, I mean, you've been talking about the 1.1s and the 2s and the Nielsen ratings and all that sort of stuff. Um, so mm-hmm. your average broadcaster has that to know how the show is doing on a week-by-week basis. So I think that happened with Charlie's Angels when they brought it out a year or two back. Um, they, they showed about four or five episodes, and the numbers just got lower and lower and lower, and then they just pulled it completely. Um, but obviously, companies like Netflix and online, they have no idea. All they have is their monthly subscription coming in, and all they need, all they know is whether that increases the monthly subscriptions because they advertise a new show. Um, so it's a totally new way of doing things. And also, I can also get financial um, funding from independent sources. So there are a few financiers who are looking at it as well. And um, then we could film it totally independently, get the pilot done that way, and then put the finished pilot out there and see if anybody wants to take up the rest of the series. So those are the three main routes, pretty much. Okay. And uh, as I see it, it looks like you've been helping uh, TNA when they go over to Europe. Am am I right on that standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I was running Real Quality Wrestling in the UK. That was my company. And uh, when TNA first came over in 2008, uh, we were chosen by Alex Shane, who was putting the show together, the tours together, um, to do their uh, entranceway and all that sort of stuff. And um, we chose the ring crew that were doing the six-sided ring when they were shipped over from the States. And uh, from there, it just started a long relationship. I mean, I became the European coordinator for the TNA shows, and I still do it now. Even though I'm in Los Angeles, I still do the logistics for their uh, their, their impact tours of the UK in January every year. Uh, and that makes sense, your connections, Kurt Angle and Winter and, and, and the bond there. Um, but, but where's Dixie Carter? Where's Where's Dixie Carter in the funding of this project? Have you not? Is she being that big of a heel that she's not going to to uh, fund this thing and get this thing on the air? Being fair about this, in all fairness, I haven't even approached Dixie Carter for one very simple reason: because I have um, a relationship with TNA. Um, I don't think it's it's fair to put um, that sort of relationship into a conflicting position. I would rather that it worked outside of the company. I mean, obviously, if the company were to come to us and say, we'll fund it, absolutely fine. But um, that's not a position that I would like to put anybody who's currently contracted with TNA in the middle of. I think that would be totally wrong. Okay, well, I'll put it out there. If Dixie's listening and uh, she's got her hand on the checkbook, you know, maybe maybe she'll float some dollars over. Um, but in seriousness, the, uh, the this emergency LA, you've got it uh got the idea, you've got everything down, it's ready to be shot. But before all of that, how did you come to Kurt Angle? I know you mentioned that uh, you've spoken to him time, you know, before he has done acting before, but uh, sure. is, is, is he the main character in this? Is he a side character? What's his role in this? Now, Kurt, Kurt is actually the main character. Now, anybody that knows Kurt knows he has the ultimate respect for anybody in a uniform. And um, basically, the, the whole point of uh, his, his character, Sergeant Gabe Mandel, is Gabe is Mr. By the Rules. He doesn't bend the rules. He doesn't break the rules. And in actual fact, we, we've got a catchphrase. When we do PSU, uh, PSAs and stuff involving Gabe, you know, public service announcements, Gabe is going to be saying things like, if you ever have, any, ever have any question about the situation, just think, what would Gabe do? And we're using those four words as a, uh, a sort of a rallying call in a way just to get people thinking right. Because in all fairness, Kurt, is, he is absolutely a phenomenal actor. When people see him doing his stuff properly, you'd be surprised. Um, he's, I, well, I met him, let's see, originally on the TNA tour in 2008. That's when we first hooked up. And then in 2011, I was back in the UK uh, helping them prepare for the January tour of 2012. And Kurt was uh, doing the promotional stuff then. And that's when we started talking about acting and everything in general. And it's um, basically, yeah, he's got a, a lot of depth to him that people have yet to see. And I'm looking forward to being able to, to, to bring it out in the character. But Gabe is the main lead character. We have other characters. I mean, uh, actor by the name of A.J. Rue is playing uh, paramedic Tom Giacalo. We have um, Greta Garland playing paramedic Stacey Brooke. And, of course, we have Katarina Lee Waters playing... Uh, Dana Lewis, who's the motorcycle cop, which is part of LAPD as well. But basically, you know, Kurt is is the lead guy. Okay, okay. And and 
I, I've seen this all over in connection with you. I have no idea what it is. So please, please uh, educate me on what's going down. Uh, K content production. What, <laughs> what, what is this for, Jay? I, I, I've never heard of it before. What is it? Okay. Well, basically, in the same way that we went from standard definition to high definition, we are now uh-huh. making the jump from high definition to 4K. And the, the simplest way to look at it is 4K is four times sharper than high definition. Wow. So the, the quality of the pictures, um, if you think of your average TV screen, you've got just over 2 million pixels in the area of your average high definition TV. Yeah? Uh, but okay. if you do it with a 4K television, if it's the same size screen, you've got over 8 million pixels in that screen. So mm. it is literally four times sharper. And if you see a 4K image, it is stunning, absolutely stunning. And um, the CES back in January over in Vegas, it was all 4K. Everybody was talking 4K. And you've seen 4K without realizing it. And the fact that most of the cameras that we used to film on 4K have been doing the movies for the last two, three, four years. If you go to the, the, uh, the RED camera website, which is literally just R-E-D, uh, and you look at the list of movies they've shot, um, you've been seeing 4K, but uh, not in its true native form, because when it gets projected in the cinema, it's only still about 2K, so it's not as sharp as it should be. But on a true 4K TV, it's absolutely stunning. 4K is the future. Um, within the next year, I think, 4K TVs will be down in price where people can get them. Uh, and uh, some of them are really, really stunning. And they will up convert from Blu-ray as well, so you'll get almost a 4K quality picture from those. But literally, it's wow. just getting to the point where our eyes won't be able to tell the difference anymore to what's real and what's on the screen. It is stunning. That sharp, huh? Uh, oh, trust I'm looking me. at... The, the foot, yeah, the first def- the demonstration I had of a 4K TV was over a year ago in um, a store here in Los Angeles. And they were demonstrating one of the Sonys, and they had a, uh, a soccer game going on. And even on the mm-hmm. wide camera of the whole field, you can almost count every blade of grass. It's crazy. Wow. I, I, I'm looking now as you speak uh, at a 75-inch 3D 4K TV. It costs that six grand, so, you know, not necessarily going to be moving into my household tomorrow, but uh, as well, you speak of it, I'm I mean, HD, Yeah, HD TVs, when they first came out, were a bit on the steep side, but then they dropped in price very quickly. It's the same now. Right. I mean, the 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 five thousand dollars Sony I saw a year ago is just over three thousand dollars now. So they're all getting within right. reach. And you can find uh-huh. um, some computer monitors which are already 4K. Um, I believe for around the seven hundred buck mark. All right. Well, I, I have to keep my eye on it now. So 4K are are you said that we're seeing it but not realizing it because it's still being presented uh, at the 2K pace, but. You said mentioned CBS. Are there other other uh, stations that actually shoot in this 4K just in case we do oh, actually yeah. have 4K TVs? Yeah, I mean, many, okay. many um, people are actually filming in 4K now. It's like uh, the other shows we've done. We've done a lot of daytime TV shows like cooking shows and stuff, and we always film in 4K. That was for over a year now we've been doing that. Um, and what we do is we just deliver the high-definition versions of the TV stations. But because uh, at the moment there's there's nobody broadcasting 4K, so it's a bit tricky, you know. Uh, but oh. basically, um, the high definition version download from a 4K camera still looks stunning because you've got that extra amount of sharpness at the start, you know. Um, and also okay. uh, Netflix, for example, I believe they just started doing tests of House of Cards. So I think the second season of House of Cards, they were doing some streaming in 4K. But if you oh, haven't wow. got a 4K TV, you're not going to get the benefit of it yet. All right, that makes sense. Okay, well, I'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, going back to Emergency LA, where do you see that? Uh, I know you're, you know, pitching, but are there, like, specific sh- um, channels that you're looking at or aiming at, ABC, uh, uh, AMC or anything specific that you'd hope for it to get on? Well, I know that uh, it's been presented to AMC. It's uh, been presented to a couple of the other majors, and I know – Today, I presented it to uh, a representative in uh, NBC Universal. Um, so, being honest with you, even though the the new way to go is the Netflix, Amazon, Hulu uh, route for right. for a lot of companies, that's quite limiting for a production company because, in my understanding, um, going that route means that 
um, you lose any other possibility of putting it elsewhere other than on that on that particular server. So if you go through ABC or I mean ABC is a really good option. I, I would love to go that route. But if you go through them, then uh, you get the choice of worldwide license because uh, shows like Grey's Anatomy, you know, they're seeing those around the world um, on on every station that'll buy it up. So basically, everybody gets a, a better deal from that initially. After the year or so that you're on the, the streaming um, platform, then yes, you can put it out wherever you want to go, but you've lost a year of motion. You know, so it's a little bit... It's nice to, to hit the press and get it, uh, get people like Kurt and Kat and all the other actors in the media and in the press around the world on various networks rather than just being reliant on one. All right. Uh, fair enough. Uh, you speak of uh, Kurt and Kat and uh, folks that you work with. Do you uh, do you still keep up with other wrestlers uh, from RQW and uh, the subsidiaries from that? Um, I believe uh, Spud um, bounced off from there and Drew McIntyre, Pages, all of them. Do you still keep up with those guys? Well, basically with the guys who been who joined with uh, WWE, Sheamus and Drew McIntyre and uh, Wade Barrett and these sort of people, it's very difficult to keep contact with them. I think they have um, a certain... Um, blockage on people that they can, you know, you know what I mean. They have a limit of people they can contact or numbers they can keep or whatever. So I haven't been able to speak to them for a while. But uh, I mean, for example, I'm the World Association of Wrestling, Ricky Knight, um, and his organization in the UK. I mean, we're almost family, and of course, their daughter is Paige. Uh, mm -hmm. So they've been doing a lot of stuff. She was over in the UK recently. So uh, keeping in touch with them has really has always been important for me because I do regard them as family. And their 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 tag team now, um, Zach and Roy, the the hooligans. I mean, for me, they're one of the top tag teams in Europe, and I've seen them grow and get better and better all the way through. And then, uh, I mean, as you say, with Spud, I was I was never more proud of than seeing Spud win that boot camp thing. And when I saw him come mm -hmm. out on TNA first, I mean, he is a phenomenal character, absolutely. And uh, one of the first times I saw him was with a company called IPW in the UK in 2005. And, man, he, his high flying was amazing. Uh, he was partnered up with a guy called Luke Dragon Phoenix, then. they were called the Dragon Hearts. But um, I followed him all the way through. And when we just started the first RQW shows, I got him on whenever I could because he's always a character. He always gives 150% and he's a phenomenal wrestler. Some of the other guys who I've worked with as well, like uh, El Deguero in the UK, really good. Uh, Martin Stone, for example, who was my former heavyweight champion. Um, he was Danny Birch in NXT for a while, but now he's mm -hmm. been released by WWE. He's back in the UK. We've uh, made such again. It's always difficult to contact them when they're in a, a part of a WWE structure. I think there must be some limits that are given as to who they can contact and who not. Uh, but also yeah. Adrian Neville, uh, Pac. I mean, I have a lot ah. of matches of PAC under RQW. Again, I haven't been in touch with him for a while, same reason. But uh, what a lovely guy. Absolutely amazing. I remember seeing him in um, Liverpool when he did a, a guest spot on Ring of Honor. And uh, his title then was the man that gravity forgot. You've only got to see him truly do his thing to believe that. He's a phenomenal wrestler. But there's yeah. a lot of British guys who are coming through now, though. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like you you must have an eye for talent here, um, since you you continue to to you know fuel these guys and get them to to where they're going to go to the next level. And with TNA, there's been a lot of talk about them possibly going to to, to Europe somewhere um, as their home base. You you know help them run things in Europe. What's your thoughts on TNA logistically being able to move? across the pond? I think they pretty much have a presence there already, you know, in, in many ways. One thing I would like to say, though, I mean, TNA, you, you hear that you hear rumors, you hear all sorts of stuff, but I can honestly tell you that TNA is a phenomenal company to work for. I really, really do love everybody that I work with on that company. I've never had any uh, backstabbing, any sort of bad stuff. It's always been an amazing atmosphere. And even now, because we, we supervise the California ring, out this side. So when they come out this way, it's, it's me and my team that uh, service the ring for them. And literally, I've met some of the some of the best people in my life while working for TNA. 
Uh, so on that, I just wanted to set that a little bit straight. So there's a lot of things which get spoken about which are not technically correct from, from my perspective. And I think that's because people just don't know the inside workings. Uh, but anyway, to answer your question, I mean, at the moment, they've started something in the UK because you know they're on Challenge TV over there. Uh, they always have a presence. They're always holding fan parties over there. And mm -hmm. um, every time they go over there to do their shows, I mean, in all fairness, they sell out. Most times they sell out. The, times of, the last time I was on a show in the UK with TNA was 2011 before I came over here. And 8,000 people in Wembley Stadium was phenomenal. At Wembley Arena, not Stadium, Wembley Arena was absolutely phenomenal. It was, the, the noise level was scary, <laughs> but it was an amazing atmosphere. Um, yeah. So they, they, have the, they have the following there, for sure. Um, I mean, whether it's a practical thing to make it a permanent base or something, I wouldn't necessarily say that, because I, I know the work that the crews go into when they're um, on the road over here, doing the house shows, mm -hmm. servicing the house shows. I mean, I've done that myself with them. I've been on the road with them for a couple of weeks at a time, doing the house shows, and the logistics of keeping it working and keeping it fresh are really, really hard. Um, and I think, in all fairness, they still making the occasional trips to the UK would work better because I, I, I'm not so sure they would be able to keep up the, the audiences over there if they're doing it week in and week out because that's the nature of British wrestling audiences. There's just too much wrestling going on over there. You know, okay. uh, I mean, every the average weekend, you've probably got about 40 or 50 federations doing their own little shows up, up and wow. down the country. It just makes it tricky. Uh, but they also, yeah. they're doing a thing now. They're making a family-friendly version of Explosion, which starts broadcasting on Challenge soon, I do believe. Uh, so that's another step in the right direction, because that means then, you know, the, the youngsters are not tied up to waiting until 9 o'clock at night to watch the show. They can actually watch it earlier in the day. Fair enough, but we all we, we hear the rumors. We hear about um, their their television ratings there and and them selling out. So when this uh, kind of talk leaked over there, I definitely wanted to get your take on it since you have firsthand uh, workings with them. But um, back to uh, back to to the show at hand. You've got this. Don't you have other uh, projects in the works in addition to Emergency LA? Yeah, I do. I've got, um, there's a, a movie project that I'm touting around at the moment that I created. Funnily enough, in the same way, the muse seems to strike me first thing in the morning. I don't know. But I, uh, I created another another character called Shadow Dancer. It's um, quite a, quite a know, it's quite an exciting movie in its own way. But uh, that's still in incredibly early stages. Because the script has been written. I've got a phenomenal script writer by the name of Richard Eastman, which is really really cool. And um, we have the script. It's with a few producers at the moment. Um, there could be some Chinese involvement in that because it involves uh, a Chinese character and some locations, you know, Hong Kong and whatever. So we might be getting, hopefully, 50% of the funding from China and we'll probably be filming in China. Um, I've got other TV things which are more like daytime TV. Um, we did a show called Chef Extraordinaire, which is really well done. I, I, I was very pleased with the way that came out. And look, back last year, we were doing, again, these daytime shows like Hollywood Makeover and Relax California Style and fitness California style. Um, so that's like a, a branding thing. But I'm moving more into drama. That was just a way for me to, to test my directing feed and make sure that I know exactly what I'm doing and to test my crew. And I've got, I have an amazing crew because of that. I have the most amazing people on my side. So I'm really proud of the way it's all come. But yeah, uh, Emergency LA has my, my total devotion now. That's my passion. That's my main thing. I've got to see all that out. We have the you know, the uniform is sorted out. We have the police badges all designed. We have the vehicles. We have everything that we need to make this work. Most important thing is we have Los Angeles uh, Police Department support, and we're about 70% in of getting the support of the fire department as well. So once we get those on board, that means our, our actors can do their ride-alongs. And that was the most amazing part. LAPD offered us ride-alongs with officers for the, uh, for the actors. Mm -hmm. And I just asked Kurt if he would be up for it. And his reply was, I would be incredibly proud to ride with LA's finest, and I thought that was the most amazing way of putting it. And you're you're actually uh, also acting in this as well on Emergency LA. Well, yeah, well, basically, my manager said to me, "I trust you've cast yourself in this." No, I, I actually hadn't. Um, so I sort of put myself in there from episode two, but that may still change. Who knows? Okay. My main thing is I need to be able to concentrate on the direction for the pilot. So I'm not going to uh, water down my focus. My focus has to be on uh, what's happening 
behind the camera so that I can see everything. And I mean, once we get this thing off the ground, it's it's going to be the start of something big. I really know it. I feel it. I see it. And uh, at the end of the day, um, I'm not going for the, the, the high drama that a lot of people go for where they go for, uh, like, you know, police corruption and all that sort of stuff. Right. This will be this will be true life. This will show the heroes for what they are. The people that when somebody dials 911 without hesitation, they go out to respond, not knowing what's waiting for them. You know, that's, I mean, as you know, in the news recently, we've lost a lot of LAPD officers. Um, so mm -hmm. basically, I just want to get the heroics out there. There will be, obviously, the few questionable subjects because reality is there will be the occasional corrupt officer. There will be the occasional bad thing which happens. But overall, I'm looking at the good the heroes do. All right, fair enough. Well, we're certainly excited for it. Do you have a timetable? Well, I know you know there's so many different variables to it, but do you have a timetable of when you think this could uh, possibly hit air? Well, basically, the, the the time scale I'm working on now, I have all my pre-production in a in a, a mode where I'm eight weeks away from camera. So basically, it means that if yeah. the money arrives tomorrow, then eight weeks from tomorrow we roll the first camera. Uh, then we have 14 days of uh, shooting on the pilot and about a, a month of uh, post-production. So, I mean, realistically, if we look at it, let's say we were to film middle of August, uh, we'd be shot by the end of August. We'd be ready to air by end of September. All right. And uh, we did just get a Facebook question. Was Kurt Angle the original person that you had in mind to star in this role? Absolutely. When I woke up in the morning, I actually, I know this may sound crazy, but uh, I saw Kurt in a sergeant police LAPD uniform. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll believe it as soon as he gets that intensity in his eyes and starts spitting and slobbering and yelling. Uh, I'll believe it. Uh, I know that folks can uh, can find all about the project and keep up. I see you posting uh, almost daily about uh, the new actors and actresses joining on board on Facebook.com forward slash emergency LA. Where else can they follow you and get more information about the project? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the project, we're pretty much um, following exclusively on Facebook, and of course we're tweeting about it. My my Facebook is uh, just basically Len Davis, that's D-A-V-I-E-S, and my uh, company website is smhollywood.com. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you, learning about the 4K. I'm excited. I'm pumped. And uh, hopefully I get to see uh, Kurt Angle on my television outside the impact ring very soon. We, we thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, yeah, have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. All right, All right. folks. Uh, very, uh, very interesting uh, interview. A take uh, producer. He, uh, he uh, owns... Uh, all the way across and the UK, it's uh, he has his own promotion, Real Quality Wrestling, here, which he name dropped probably uh, half of every, uh, or maybe more half of the European wrestlers that are uh, on the screen today. They've come through his organization, one form or fashion. Uh, he's got this big, big, big project coming up. Hopefully, he's he's pitching for 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 the uh, the primetime channel. So. Hopefully they uh, get picked up soon here.